Welcome back. As I did with part one, allow me to give you a framework for part two to help set up this latter half of our discussion. We jump right back into the dangerous aspects of magical practices, and this leads us into the creation of gateways that allow entities through, which might account for all of the high strangeness. Thomas notes the seeming contradiction with the way Crowley spoke about the idea of gateways because... In his writings, there is no duality. This leads into a discussion about the entities that one encounters in anomalous events. Are these subjective or objective? Which then leads me to talk a little bit about tulpas and the different ways of thinking about these beings. We then move on to discuss our opinions about scholarly research and how we can approach all of this. There's definitely a Mulder Scully vibe going on in this part. And then we wrap up our roundtable discussion with some remarks on Hillier as a powerful, a cultural product, aesthetics, and if scholars could perhaps lend any insights to researchers as they conduct their own field work. So let's get back into it. Thinking along the lines of kind of dangerous uh, entities which it seems like what we're talking about is that we're talking about dangerous entities and we're talking about chaos, magic. And this to me, if I'm just kind of like free associating this like ties in then uh, into this Kenneth Grant type of magic that's bringing in Lovecraft and the old ones. And these old ones are terrifying. So the, the kind of cosmic uh, madness of Lovecraft, they're terrifying because they're indifferent. Mm. So it's this entire pursuit of truth and uh, what's real and just humanism. And it's Lovecraft's characters go beyond the limits of humanist truth and they come face to face with these cosmic entities that do not care at all. And they're so beyond anything that this scientific mind can comprehend that they go mad perceiving them. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the Lovecraft cosmic horror. And then Kenneth Grant flows these uh, old gods, the Lovecraftian entities, through the mob zone again into the night side. And it's, it's these old ancient extreme forces that are beyond the circles outside the circles of time um, can be interacted with, but they really don't care. Well, Nathan Isaac talks about Kenneth Grant opening a gateway. Uh, he also talked about the uh, Adina and Hopewell uh, Native American tribes also. There's a legend that they also opened some kind of portal. There's a, also a legend that Crowley also opened a portal uh, and that this could account for what's what's going on with all of this high strangeness. That's why people are experiencing what they're experiencing because there is this, you know, kind of coming back around again to the first topic, that there's this uh, opening that has been created where the other is now coming through. And that's what we're experiencing. We're experiencing this other and it can be anything. It can take any shape. It can take, you know, it could look like a goblin. It can look like a mothman. It can look like a, an alien or a craft in the air flying around. It, it does, it just, whatever. It's just anything that you can imagine. And, and you go to the imagination again. So, yeah, I don't know if we're like circling around <laughs> again to the to the beginning. I don't know if you have any anything you want to add to that about the gateways purposefully or not opened. Well, so Thomas, do you think crossing the abyss is uh, opening a gateway? Maybe, maybe not spatial temporally, but in this mob zone imaginality or as a spirituality. Because a lot of people say 
Parsons and Hubbard, uh, when they tried to cross the abyss in the desert, that's what brought about Roswell. Um, and then yeah. Crowley's initial experiments with crossing the abyss created the, the cracks for gateways to kind of uh, precipitate and multiply across time itself. So as a, a Crowley scholar, like how do you engage gateways? Well, this again brings us back to the first question of <laughs> what's, what's happening inside and outside. As far as what Crowley has written, he seems to, and again, Crowley's not writing for a specialized audience, so there's a large probability that he's not giving the whole truth. That's very obvious from his writings. For Crowley, at Crossing the Abyss is, is really a psychological experience, that's how he presents it more than you're actually opening a gateway into the cosmos or whatever. You're literally invoking parts of your unconscious into consciousness. So this is an experience of an other, even though it is actually not, it is something that shouldn't be other. And a large part of Crowley's philosophy is that all of these other parts in yourself, AKA thoughts you're not acknowledging as part of yourself, you should unite with them to a certain extent. You should bring them into consciousness and acknowledge them so that they don't have power over you. So crossing the abyss would be um, invoking the worst parts of yourselves, hidden, anchored deep in your unconscious, confronting them and releasing them. Crowley uses um, this metaphor of Everything in the abyss is craving to become real, but it's not because everything we think is real is in a way an illusion because nothing is fixed. Nothing is material. Everything is chaos in a way, but it's not threatening. Like we think it's threatening because it threatens our sense of subjectivity, but it, but it's not. We should embrace it. So... That's, again, the thing that I, as a Crowley scholar, find so fascinating. I'm not used to this conversation about actual external beings. I'm used to occultists describing encountering entities, but not making a statement about their external status, about their objective reality, because the whole point of magic would be to transcend that very idea that you can encounter external beings. It's kind of, it kind of goes against magical logic. Yet you're not supposed to think that way. You're supposed to conquer that idea that there is a difference between you and anything else. So I think Crowley, I, I'm not sure how he would have felt about this idea that the abyss is opening up the, the world to external beings. I think he would find it confusing for people interested in magic because his whole point would be to negate that possibility. Like there is no difference between you and any one thing. The, the, the whole point of me trying to teach you magic is so that you can let go of that concept, which is poison. You know, you're never. Yeah. Is, is this making any sense? It's making this sense. very idea yeah. of externality is something to overcome. And it seems that in this UFO lore, it's the exact opposite. You're actually battling these external entities that are actually coming from a different place. It kind of goes against Crowley's magical rationale that you can't go to another place and other beings can't really come from another place because on higher magical planes, none of these distinctions make any sense. So it's something I struggle with as well. It doesn't seem to fit within the language that I'm used to. No, I think, I think that's great to have incorporated my, my tricky logic just kind of makes everything work with everything else. Uh, so I, I don't really take the person who said it as an authority on what was said, which has a lot of contention. Um, and I, I think Grant, also approached Crowley that way. And I, I don't really know much about Crowley's, for lack of a better term, like 
cosm- spiritual cosmology. But what, what it sounds like is that the these imaginal, like the mob zone plateau, doesn't really make sense with linear space time because you have to like you have to put the outside outside of space time. And the way I'm approaching all of this is through process, process philosophy, which is the kind of the Mobius strip unfolding, becoming a meshment, for lack of more simple terms, where the outside is already here and it's a matter of opening it up. So it's not that extraterrestrials are extraterrestrial, but to kind of quote... Um, an anthology on DMT, it's inner paths to outer space. And so that this kind of creates, after Crowley, a bleeding over and an overlap between the spiritual, which for him is kind of ineffable, inaccessible, and abstract, whereas in the, the postmodern milieu, things start to congeal and uh, infect each other. Um, which perhaps that came about through his initial experiments. Um, But we're we're on the precipice of like the deep philosophical questions about how reality works and the the different ways that we approach space time show where each of us can go with thinking through kind of the, the abstract metaphysics of magic. Well, I would also offer that, in in our uh, present day, in contemporary ways of looking at entities, uh, maybe this would be a good time to talk about the tulpa. Tulpas are normally seen as non-physical entities, but they're seen as real. They're seen as autonomous beings, just like you and I are autonomous. So, but there's like a, there's almost like a gradation of, emanations, I guess you could say, or ways of looking at these entities. You have the sigil, which is a a sentient symbol. It has a, an intelligence about it, but it's it's confined in, in, in a space that that the you know the person is drawing it and making it is confined in that space. Then you have these other ways of looking at sentience. And that's when you get into tulpas and other terms like servitors and egregores and things like that. But the tulpa is kind of a double thing. It can be seen as non-physical, but it can also be seen as physical in certain... It it just depends on how you're interpreting the the term. Tulpa is not an English uh, term. It comes... It's a Tibetan term. And it's been appropriated. Here we go into this kind of appropriating and mixing, uh, mixing up things of, of meanings. Uh, it's been appropriated by the West to indicate that there is another word uh, is, is thought form. And this is coming. It's these Eastern ideas that were filtered through theosophy. And now we have this Westernized idea of what a thought form can be and a lot of times nowadays we call them tulpas now there are ways of looking at the tulpa as as a psychological mental process that creates a sentient being that resides non-physical it resides in the mind of the creator of the host so we have like a plural system going on and you have more than one entity in one brain. So you have more than one entity in one host, one physical body. Some people talk about that as as if there's no magic involved. It's just visualization, concentration, and time that creates this other entity. Then you have the tulpamancers, which are chaos magic. That's That's a form of chaos magic. And they are taking magical ideas and concepts and applying that to creating this non-physical entity. But then there's this other idea that seems to also have been taken from Eastern thought that you can create this duplicate of yourself 
or a duplicate of something and of whatever it may be, and that it does have a physical form. And that's when you get into these tales of the Mothman, the strange Mothman entities, uh, not the Mothman itself, but the strange people that, that are encountered that don't seem to be acting right. They don't seem to walk right. They don't seem to talk right. They just seem to be these weird, <laughs> weird people. Uh, those people are thought to be like accidental tulpas. So you have intentional, accidental, you have non-physical, you have physical. There are all of these, these concepts out there. And when in the show, Jeff Ritzman said that he thought Terry Wrist was a sigil, uh, I would tend to agree with what the, the guys from the Weird Studies podcast talked about and said that Terry Wrist is a tulpa. I would tend to think he's more of a tulpa. And whether or not Terry Wrist is a non-physical tulpa or a physical tulpa, it doesn't really matter because tulpas can live virtually. Tulpas nowadays with technology live virtually. They interact as if they are real people and they're considered real people. They interact with other actual people like you and me that have physical bodies. And you wouldn't even know it. I know that I had a point in all of this. <laughs> oh, I think yeah. we were talking about how reality works, like pretty basic stuff. Uh, but re- how reality pretty works. basic stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I basically opened up the, this whole debate about <laughs> can you open a gateway to external beings or are they automatically a manifestation of ourselves, of our minds? Right. Is everything yeah. mind? I mean, this all ties into that. Yes. So, yeah, the tulpa does tie into that. Because now you also have then the egregore, which yeah. is a collective type of tulpa. That I guess the, the most common, well-known uh, example of that would be Slender Man. So you have this collective concentration, visualization, uh, and and uh, using over a period of time, this idea, this thought form becomes more and more real. And now you have people that say, "I have seen the Slender Man. I do things for the Slender Man." I, you know, that there's the the case of the two young girls who attacked their friend, saying that they were going to do that for the Slender Man and that they had seen the Slender Man. I mean, we of course. This opens up a com- completely different can of worms. We get back into the whole mental illness aspect of of all of this, and we get into folie à deux, you know, concepts like that. The madness of two that you know one person can can affect another person in the way they think about things. I think that's I, I don't really intend to get into all of that, but there there does seem to be this modern day difference in. The way magic is viewed and the way it is utilized and the ease in which it is utilized. I don't personally, I mean, I can't speak with authority and from experience because I have not spoken to every person who uses chaos magic as, you know, as a form. But it seems like younger people have a much easier time utilizing the concept of chaos magic than someone like, you know, an older a ceremonial magician would like a, an Alan Greenfield, for example, you know, there are strict, you know, practices that you have to follow. You have to learn things beforehand. You have to, you know, there's this rigid structure of things that you have to do. Even though Crowley was a little bit, I would say maybe kind of on the fence about some of those things that he thought that, you know, you could be a little bit more flexible in in what you do. At least that's what I've learned from you, Thomas, that he seemed to be a little bit more free thinking in that way. But chaos magic, as far as, you know, as, as how I understand it, it seems to be very accessible and very easy for younger people nowadays to access. And I don't know if Robert wants to add anything to that. Crowley, with, when he articulates magic with a K, um, science and art of change in accordance with will. Um, from my understanding, 
Crowley wanted to, and even occultism, um, it's about making spirituality and empirical science coincide. That's kind of been one of the goals from the get-go. Correct me if I'm wrong. And so as academic uh, theory has progressed through the 20th century, science has kind of stagnated. Like we have quantum physics and that's pretty up to date, but non-scientific theory, um, post-structural philosophy kept going and kept articulating new ways of thinking things through um, expansive reality rather than reductive. We talked about this in the hyperstition episode. Mm -hmm. So if the magician has to navigate their magical affect in accordance with the parameters of reality and what reality can and can't do or is allowed to do at this point, when you put the post-structural approach to reality or what reality can be into the mix, you start to get this more chaotic space that allows for things to be navigated in different ways. This is why hyperstition is such a a dynamic concept because its entire approach to time is based off of something that is consistent with science, but can do lots of things that a scientific material reality can't. Um, And of course, egregores and tulpas are consistent with kind of the hyperstitional model Mm. fictions becoming real. Um, plug yeah. back into the mob zone and we right. get again one of these uh, synchronicities of magic theory I'm kind of wondering now if if we've kind of said what we wanted to say about the quote unquote weird stuff, and then we can kind of now start talking about the more you know research side of everything. Um, I'm sure mm-hmm. there's you know tons more that we could say about all of this stuff, but at a certain point, I think you have to kind of make a decision to say, okay, this is what this is the basic idea of what we think, and then we're you know we're gonna kind of round that up and and move on. So one of the questions that came up when we were talking about this was, are we studying the interpretation of the high strangeness or are we studying the events themselves? What what do you think about that? Great question. Um, (laughs) It kind of, don't you think, makes me remember all of the emic versus etic. Yeah discussions that we have had throughout the years together in the classroom. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of an impossible. I think you're doing both. I think you're doing both, personally. I don't think you can separate the two. I think you have to look at it in, in both, both ways. I think you have to, and as a researcher, you're just going to have to say, okay, this is what's happening. And then you can try to separate the threads a little bit, but I don't think you yeah. can do it entirely. So, I mean, that that would just be my my short answer. Um, in a, go ahead. If I can, ex- yeah, sure. if, I can, if I can expand on that, um, in a way, the interpretation is the act itself, kind of. Like yeah. to use an example, Penny Royal. There was a moment where. I had a hard time as an as as an edic sort of an outside academic perspective when um I don't know I don't know which episode or when it came about but there was this this connection made between the book of lies which has as a subtitle you know the, with the word breaks in it and there yes. was this quite dramatic connection between that book and the actual place yes. breaks and even a suggestion that the tarot card, the moon was like a map of the Eastern Kentucky border. And it was very, and, and that one of the figures was pointing to Hellier in the car. And it was a moment where I, as a researcher kind of laughed out loud because it, it just made me realize that what, once you're in the middle of all of this, 
it's so easy to forget about the outside context. Like for Crowley, Hellier doesn't, I mean, it, it's very unlikely that it had any significance for him that the Eastern Kentucky board, I mean, all of this, all of these connections rely on an a priori belief that what is happening in Kentucky is somehow central to what magic is about, what UFO lore is about. So it's something you bring in to the conversation. Mm -hmm. But in a way I had to inject myself back into that emic level because the fact that that interpretation was made was part of what I could study as a researcher because for the researchers of Penny Royal and for Hellier, the connections themselves aren't necessarily so crucial. It's the emotional intensity Mm -hmm that it that these connections provoke that is actually what's happening so that's interesting for me like we can pick apart all of the literary references that are being made in penny royal and hellier but they're not really what's happening what's happening is i mean i consider hellier to be a beautiful recording of what it feels like to be called and we can focus on their investigation, but we can also focus on what it does to them as emotional beings, how they're, how they respond, how they cope with having results one second, not having any results, you know, the next second. So at the same time as religious studies scholars, we can comment on all of the literary references. So yeah, that's something that I was thinking about like, what can we add to their journey? Maybe context information, but at the end of the day, what is happening in Hellier isn't necessarily the goblins or the experiments, but it's their, yeah, the fact that their interpretation process changes so significantly because of a couple of events, that is kind of the event itself. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of helped me to, a certain what kind of position can we take as a scholar watching this you know do we have to come at it with a critical perspective or can we just appreciate everything that's going on mm. so yeah i don't know if any of you wants to hop on that train i i feel like uh the last hour two hours have been a good case study for the question at hand like how do you do research on this <laughs> uh, and as you said it's it's gonna be both because there is no objective perspective anymore, especially on a topic that comes out of subjective appropriations and modulations and recontextualizations over the last 200 years. So if we try and play the, the emic edit game, we're really just playing emic versus a different kind of emic. Uh, yes. So it's, The way I look at it is uh, a question that I thought about a lot in the master's program at University of Amsterdam was was the so what of kind of the critical approach. And we're getting further, I think, from any resounding so what's because we can't just point at truths anymore. Um, So what I think is kind of important for discourse around Hellier and kind of discussing topics such as this is articulating modes of thinking um, outside of kind of the objective subjective binary. And I think Hellier does a good job at demonstrating magical thought without it descending into uh, magical conspiracy thought. And this, this goes back to what I said with correspondences. Navigating corresponding resonance and flowing across synchronicities is a very different approach than putting, synchronous, putting coincidences into a linear causal line. Um, it's, it's thinking about magic scientifically versus thinking about magic magically And I think we've gotten past the point of thinking about magic scientifically uh, to perhaps a dangerous extent Um, with QAnon. They were thinking about abstract, weird phenomenon scientifically, which creates this causal conspiracy narrative 
that's very threatening, black and white, and binary. Whereas in Hellier, they never commit to any one point. They engage ideas and allow them to unfold, but none of, they don't pick any one specific way of thinking, um, but they still plug into the way of thinking. And as scholars, I think there's a lot to be learned there. And I think hmm. switching up the game a little bit to think in that way is going to change what the so what of academic research is. Um, but I'm an experimental scholar, um, so not not a religious scholar, but I'm very aware that I'm trying to change the rules by playing the rules to their conclusions. Very interesting. So in this in this aspect, what you're trying to do, it sounds like Robert, is remove the limitations that religious studies scholars have, basically, for the the researchers that would not categorize themselves as experimental as you do. That we're kind of, you know, we kind of have this the set number of methodologies that you can use, and that's it. You know, outside of that, then it does start to get you know, very, you, you start to go in, you know, out, outside of the boundaries of what you're allowed, quote unquote, allowed to do. And I think this type of phenomena is, is almost putting the researcher in that position of being outside of the boundaries of what you're allowed to do. Now, somebody like Kripal, I think with his book, The Supernatural, I think he was making an attempt to be inclusive, like we talked about in the beginning, that that this was not something that was outside of our natural realm, but it's just something that that is a part of it, even though we might not recognize it as such. However, as you know, as we all know, <laughs> within academia, that that type of standpoint is not easily accepted. I think what would help the most is if scholars shared more of their own anomalous experiences. This is something Kripal does, not only in the supernatural, Mm -hmm. also um, in the Serpent's Gift, for example. I mean, Kripal has sort of become this, I don't want to say guru, but this central scholar you go to when you're experiencing anomalies or mystical experiences. He receives regular letters from students. Uh, sometimes who turn out to be colleagues who um, are encountering these these extremely these extreme experiences that they don't know how to in, how to interpret. Yeah. It's kind of an equivalent of the Terry Wrist emails, but instead of it being an email, you're having a full on mystical experience mm-hmm. that completely shakes up your perception of reality. And these are often people who have absolutely no spiritual experience, no interest in, I mean, I have, I'm not going to out him, but I had a a professor at the University of Amsterdam who shared exactly that situation with us in, in a small classroom setting where he said, yeah, I've also had a random mystical ascent experience that I don't know how to explain. It was the most powerful experience of my life, but yeah, as a scholar, I can't use that because it's not considered to be a tool for anything, which is kind of super disappointing. Yeah, that's like defeating the whole purpose of what it is that we're doing when we're trying to study anomalous experiences. I mean, this is this and this has been happening forever. I mean, all of yes. the stuff that happened, all the stories in the Bible about the the manna that falls from heaven. I mean, you could you could compare that to the meat shower, you know, the meat falling from the sky. Um, burning bushes, uh, Saul's conversion to Paul. He's, you know, the beam of light coming down upon him. He's blinded. And then, you know, he has this complete change in his life. You know, visits from angels. If we could talk about angels and gods and demons and devils, and spirits and all these miracles that are happening, everybody accepts that as being okay to study. 
and nobody, you know, raises an eyebrow when you start talking about these types of experiences that happened in the past, why are we so hung up on, you know, wanting to exclude this type of the same type of experiences that people are having from our research now? It's like it's just, you know, taboo. We can't we can't talk about that. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, that's the thing I don't understand. Why is this considered fringe? Why is this considered, you know, well, if you start doing stuff like this, then we can't take you seriously as a researcher. Well, it upsets everything that is consensus <laughs> reality. <laughs> I mean, this reminds me a lot of, uh, of um, Diego Escolar's article, Boundaries of Anthropology. I don't know if you guys read it. It's, I didn't get I really, around to reading it. I'm sorry. I didn't. I that's didn't totally it. fine. It's actually quite simple. And in its simplicity lies its surprisingness. It, it, it's an anthropologist who had significant experiences with anomalous lights it, during an anthropological research session in, in Argentina. Uh, and it's beautifully described. And that's basically the first half of the article is him just describing this relatively unspectacular, but still very anomalous experience with, with lights um, that seemed to follow them, changed color, these lights arranged in a triangular form at a certain point. And very similarly to Hellier, which is something I've always been fascinated by, the experience included mood shifts from mm. intensity and fear to certain sudden tranquility, feelings of harmony, peace, back to intensity, fear, seemingly unexplainable waves of emotion. And these lights were observed by, I think it was a it was at least accompanied by like three to four people who all saw the same mm -hmm. thing. And this occurred for several hours. And this happened in 1989, uh, 1998, and the article was published in 2012. And Escolar describes being very conflicted about whether or not he should even admit this as a scholar, because just like you said, it's kind of you're opening yourself up to your entire reputation as an yeah. academic being questioned for, see, for literally seeing something that is empirical. So it's a very interesting example of a scholar literally struggling with just seeing something and feeling like his entire profession and its limits are being threatened, mm. even though he's actually having a very simple experience. And what also ties into that is that in Argentina, in, in the groups he's trying to study, these lights are familiar. There are religious theories about what these lights are. There are psychological theories about what these lights are. And Escolar claims that as an anthropologist, he's only supposed to study those interpretations and interpret them as kind of a social structure, but completely disregard the possibility that there could be an empirical element to these interpretations. So it's almost like we're being forced as academics to automatically go straight to interpretation and mm -hmm. skip the fact that the interpretations might actually have an empirical component. Yeah. So Escolar proposes the term um, empirical extraordinary. It's kind of very similar to Kripal supernatural. I think Escolar's is actually a little bit better because it's more you can use it more easily. Like um, I've experienced something uh, empirical, extraordinary. It, it was empirical, but it, it challenges our mm -hmm. basic beliefs about how reality works. And I think it might sound simple and naive, but by having a term like that and by including it in the methodological apparatus that we can use, you're opening up the possibility of scholars engaging with these experiences. Because if you don't have any terms for it, it's like you can't even describe or publish these, these features of your experience. Like mm -hmm. I said, I've experienced significant anomalous things, yeah. and I would like to talk about it. Um, this is something Kripal also mentions, and it's something we've been kind of tapping into. Younger generations aren't necessarily hostile towards scientific investigation. I think Kripal mentioned something of... Um, people who have these experiences are not afraid of 
having a brain scan. Maybe they even want a brain scan. Maybe mm-hmm. they want scientists to come in and say, hey, we also want to know what's going on. If it's not threatening, if it's not from the standpoint of, hey, we're going to disprove everything that's happening to you because it's going to be hallucination, I think yeah. actually it would be amazing if there could be a bridge between like actual scientific research, quantitative yeah. research, and a group of, I don't know, occultists who is who are perfectly fine performing an occultist ritual while being observed. I mean, why not? It's, it's, it's super interesting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I think this willingness from both sides to share in that kind of communion would be a way out to sort of, yeah, not feel uncomfortable because it's just scholars talking about this mm-hmm. stuff. Not to throw us into another vortex of high strangeness, I think a good example of being allowed to take risks and approach subjective experience uh, a little more honestly comes out of Dr. Rick Strassman's research into DMT Mm -hmm. uh, phenomena in the 90s. And so he created a very rigorous scientific methodology. He incorporated um, Buddhist kind of thought processing techniques alongside uh, psychological analyses. It was done clinically. It was done comfortably. And we have a great storehouse of uh, DMT experience now because of that. Uh, And the vortex that I can try and avoid is one of the biggest instances of what happened in these DMT experiments was alien interactions, Mm -hmm. specifically with mantis creatures, uh, which is a direct relation to Carl's hypnosis Mm -hmm. session. I think really worth looking into kind of intermediary beings and entheogenic experience for someone interested in this space. Uh, But also the DMT as an endogenous substance, all of the research that Strassman did he started comparing it to UFO abduction scenarios and finding the incidence, coincidence, and overlap between the two without making any hard line distinctions, but acknowledging the the weirdness in these phenomena. And when you bring occultism and trance states into this mob zone, for lack of a better term, you start to get more weird synchronicities bring bring a sleep paralysis into the picture, you start to get even more weird synchronicities. And these are all things that are anomalous in 21st century science. Like science is poking at them, but there's something missing to understand them. Uh, Same thing with uh, humanities. We're poking at them, but we're missing something to validate them. And until people can start experimenting safely, but with actual weight behind being taken seriously, Mm -hmm. I don't think we'll get past those boundaries. We'll just try and explain them away. I think those are really good points that the, the stigma that's put upon all of this needs to be lifted. And I like the, the, the ideas that, that you both are bringing forth about, you know, different ways of talking about it, different way, different words that we can use for it. Um, of course, we're not going to sort this out, <laughs> the three of us here today, but I, I do hope that this is something that more uh, people within academia will start talking about. That's one thing. And the other thing is when you guys were talking about this whole aspect of the DMT and that that these things could be happening in the brain. And and that's something that came up in Hellier as well, that they were looking at the possibility of non-physical abductions. And I thought that was also interesting, and it seemed like it could tie into what we were just talking about here. So, yeah, that's kind of the, I guess, the sciencey part of it, maybe. But then we also have this whole narrative of disenchantment and re-enchantment that uh, researchers talk about. And I think that Robert wanted to say something about that. 
Yeah, I can touch on that really quickly. Okay. Um, the disenchantment secularization thesis, uh, more or less by Weber, uh, is that after the Enlightenment, through a series of problems and solutions, and uh, our outlook on reality has become more and more material, scientific, and less and less abstract and spiritual. Uh, it has been disenchanted. A mm-hmm. um, really, really quick way of putting it. Yeah. And so there's the re-enchantment model, which kind of coincides with uh, the linear space-time. We need to go into enchantment again. It's kind of reactive. It's, it's what's next. So it, enchantment's kind of dead. And what I talked about with hyper-occultation in the hyperstition episode mm-hmm. is to quote both Hellier and H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, it's not that these things are dead. It's that they're dreaming. They're sleeping right mm-hmm. now. And so they need to be woken up or remembered, allowed to unfold again, because they're still here. It's just noise that's lost in the signal rather than something that we have to locate again um, or kind of afford mm-hmm. work into. So it's yeah. it's finding the things that are already here or remembering them and waking them up with what we have, uh, which I think was a, a really big element of Hellier for me. It was not dead, but dreaming. When the stars are right, kind of Cthulhu will come back. Uh, right. same, thing with Anna, same thing with this, this new magic. I kind of think of Hellier as what I'm calling a hyper cluster. So it's, it's a cluster of hyperlinks, kind of like Wikipedia, Every article links to other articles and you can kind of navigate this rhizome in a nonlinear, like a temporal way. And I think of Hellier the same way because we get all these big uh, movements from Western esoteric research for a simple way of putting it. But we also get methodologies. We get alternative kind of um, ways of approaching it. And it all gets circulated, but also combined. And so as a media entity that is now loose, people engage this hypercluster and all the hyperstition, you start to kind of get a a word virus, a media virus, a thought virus, uh, an egregore. And these things spread and they, they start to wake up and give, make people remember the virtualities that they didn't have access to before. If that mm-hmm. kind of follows, I like it. yeah. Hyperclusters. It's a, a rhizome within a rhizome. Rhizomes all the way down, honestly. <laughs> what do you think about that, Thomas? I totally agree with that. <laughs> the, the The only reason I would say it is a little bit something new, but this has been pointed out by a lot of people. Um, it's a lot less gimmicky it's actually very serious mm, kind of artistic yeah. almost mm-hmm. definitely i think it's it's not what you expect of a paranormal docu series because the the team itself is actually skeptical and i think that's what's so fascinating about it they're not presenting themselves as experts who mm-hmm. are gonna cure a haunted house for example i mean that's like the typical trope right Mm -hmm. we're gonna call a team of experts and they're gonna solve something and hopefully we're gonna see some weird stuff but this is a group of people who's searching who's asking literally asking the viewing audience to help them which was extremely successful Mm -hmm. so i think that's maybe a little bit new to me it feels both as something that we know, of of course, these these anomalies happen. People feel this way. These discussions have been happening online for for decades. But it, yeah, it feels kind of new. I was really intrigued by this idea that the the docu series itself could be a form of initiation for the viewers. <laughs> like something something that really struck me was, and I think I I read this on Reddit, but. 
after I noticed it myself that the entire last, the, the second season, the background music they use is incorporates these three tones that Dana hears in the, you know, what I consider to be the most spectacular experiment, you know, the Dana's God helmet experiment yeah. um, where she hears these tones over and over and yeah. over. And I thought that was really striking that, that the docu-series itself has become part of the manifestation, so to speak. Mm, mm-hmm. It's, it's, it, it also reminded me that a lot of people felt nauseous hearing the tones in the cave. I myself felt nauseous hearing the sounds. So it was a quite a unique experience to feel nauseous hearing those tones while the entire team was describing getting nauseous yeah. by those tones. And a lot of people feel so compelled to join in this investigation because it is an ongoing investigation and it's never going to stop. Like they literally say, we're going to be trying to figure this out forever. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a kind of a new form of entertainment. It doesn't exactly feel like entertainment. It feels like something everyone needs to tune into so that we can all help each other figure this out. Yeah. And as, scholars can join that, I think. Yeah, that that would be great. And to your to your point about it feeling to me it seemed like it was very authentic as opposed to other paranormal shows that are on TV where you're kind of like, is this fake? Or, I mean, are they like put? Are they like setting all this stuff up and then you know making it look like all this stuff is happening, but it's not really happening? Just just to get you know the jump scares and to make it an entertaining show, but the stuff that they're representing isn't actually happening as they're putting it forth. So there's an element of you know fiction that's that's put into it, but it's for entertainment. So you know nobody. Nobody gets really mad about it, but at the same time, it doesn't feel authentic. This feels authentic to me. And season one for me was there were so many elements of uh, Twin Peaks that I kept seeing over and over again. Whether it be the just the shots, the way that the the, the shots were made, there was a antenna on top of the hotel. The, you know, that, you know, hotel is a liminal space and there's an antenna like, you know, waiting for, you know, the energy to come down into this liminal space. Other things about the the ceiling fan. I mean, that's totally Twin Peaks, you know, so it's like David Lynch was just throughout the, <laughs> the first season. I mean, for somebody like me who is crazy about Twin Peaks, I mean, I'm like super sensitive to stuff like that, but it's beautiful to look at. And it's authentic. Not that I am a avid watcher of television and of paranormal uh, shows, but the shows that I have seen in the past, this doesn't feel like the same thing. I don't know what you feel about that, Robert. No, I, I agree. Um, I think the aesthetic element is really important, uh, especially because art has been such a big component of a, occultism in the 20th right. century. Like the, the Golden Dawn was a bunch of, famous artists at the time Crowley was doing theater rituals um Anton Artaud was a theater person doing what I would call definitely magic ritual um Austin Austin Spare was an artist Mm -hmm. Kenneth Grant and his wife Steffi Grant artists um the the art academic magic ontology overlap is screaming at us right now and because we have them all as separate things, we're not letting them show the expanse of kind of their becomings. So yeah, the, the artistic aspect, I think, makes a huge difference with Hellier. And I totally agree with how well it was done and what happens because it was allowed to be something creative without having to worry about looking fake. Right. Also, I think they engaged with scholarly theory, not a lot, but the, this whole tangent um, on the liminal, I mean, that was straight out of, yeah. a, out of an anthropologist's book. So that felt, yeah, that's something new that's happening that wasn't available a couple of decades ago. These people interested in Hellier can also read academic research if it's available to them. Yeah. 
and include that in their investigation. I think that can be so helpful. Like one of the things that that's, I think a role we could potentially and controversially play. Um, We could almost, you could say, do the literary research for this team if we wanted to, you know what I mean? (laughs) So that's an option. And I feel like this show has inspired me as a scholar, which, I mean, that's even more unexpected, I think, for because for, as far as I got it, the team didn't even expect this series to be successful. And we're here talking about it. And yeah. me, I, as a scholar, am now inspired to do different kind of work because of seeing this show. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, maybe that opens a whole other can of worms, but I think that this possibility now that, that a, that a popular entertainment product can also influence scholarship that feels new to me. Yeah. It feels like an invitation for a lot of people. Yeah. Or it can engage scholars in a different way than what they normally uh, or how they normally would be engaged. I think it's a powerful pop culture product in that we're still talking about this years after the show has been released. I mean, you know, we're late. I mean, I'm late to the party, uh, definitely, about this, but it's still relevant. It does not diminish uh, in in that regard. The the time that goes by does not, it doesn't lessen the effect of of the effect of the show. So arguably it intensifies it because we're just kind of elaborating on it and it's only getting weirder uh, outside of the show itself. (laughs) Right. Yes. And I mean, there is, I mean, you both know all the stuff that I wrote down that we could possibly talk about and we've maybe touched maybe not even half of it. And we've been talking for almost, you know, three hours. So this is, I mean, this, this, you could talk about this. You could make a whole series out of this, talking about all of this stuff. Perhaps a uh, PhD dissertation. You could, you, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so yeah we've been going for quite a long time i can imagine that we're all getting a little bit tired the only thing i do want to ask is if there's anything that we didn't touch on that you feel like is important that we should make sure that it gets mentioned here now um lamb is not an alien no that's just a joke um (laughs) it's just it ties into my real answer um (laughs) there's this there's this um assumption now that that this picture that crowley drew was was called lamb and was an extraterrestrial and i've read so many blog posts about it uh and the, the interesting fact of the matter is that um, the, the picture was never tied to the name Lamb, um, and Crowley never communicated with an entity called Lamb. Um, th- this whole thing is tied to an Amalantra working, which was, you know, it involved it being called Amalantra. And, you know, we're basically dealing with, with a different sources that are, that are strung together incorrectly from an objective standpoint. So... Of course, it doesn't matter. I'm, you know, I'm not upset about that. It's just interesting that in those cases, you are suddenly snapping back into academic mode. Yeah. Because there's two different kinds of interpreting information going on. We're taught to collect and uh, process information Mm -hmm. differently. And I think maybe that's something we need to discuss shortly this is a question I sometimes I imagine when, when, when we're talking about this stuff, I imagine different professors that we've had <laughs> and the questions they would ask us. Definitely. Um, and I think one question that always keeps popping up in my mind is like, what can we ultimately contribute? Like why? 
And maybe this is a bit of a controversial question because it ties back in, into the taboo stuff. But it's just an open question. Should it be encouraged for scholars to sort of dip their toe into this different kind of way of interpreting information? Like, um, I don't know how I can say this correctly. Should we, as a scholarly community, go into this magical logic? Or should we just become magicians? Like, it's a simple question, but it throws me for a loop sometimes because I think this whole idea of a grand theory that connects all of these phenomena, it's very exciting. And your mind naturally seeks connections where there might not be. And I feel like there's also still value in the traditional scholarly way of letting that be part of a different community and, and sort of respecting that. And for me, myself, the boundaries are not always clear. Like, do I have anything to offer in, in this respect? Um, should we really go there? It reminds me of Kripal suggesting we should have a Gnostic study of religion. Like we should make a place for this within the walls of the university to allow students to engage with anomalous experience intentionally, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And this reminds me a lot about about Johannes comments about this. Like, if we're not going to be able to translate these experiences into academic language, because these experiences are just not amenable to academic language, is there a point in trying to include them in academic language? I don't know. It's it's something I've never found a clear answer to, because I feel like. I'm also just interested in magic. Like, sorry, confession time. <laughs> like, I think a lot of academics are dealing with these double interests. Mm. And it's sort of coming from both sides. I can also imagine someone like Crowley telling me, why are you wasting? If you really want to understand what's going on, why are you even trying to be a scholar? Just become a magician. Like, why <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? Like, skip all of this. Just yeah. do the rituals, do what you have to do, and, and you'll understand. You won't understand as a scholar, but does that matter? I don't know. It's just a question I want to throw at you guys, because I think a lot of listeners might be thinking, is this still academic? Isn't this just scholars sort of taking off their hat a little bit and exploring their other personal interests? I don't know. Maybe that's a bit rude, but it's something that it's a discussion we need to have still, I think, maybe. Well, I think that that maybe from the the Amsterdam school that maybe I'm, I'm just guessing here, you know, given what I know, what I've learned, you know, being in Amsterdam, that they play, they put up a lot of importance on the historical aspect of what has happened. So I guess, what could I use as, a, as an example of this? Like what I was talking about tulpas, you know, a lot of, a lot of people talk about tulpas in a way that they only use the appropriated meaning of the concept of the tulpa as we understand it now in the West, but knowing that there is a source of where this word comes from, what it originally meant, that the idea of the tulpa was conflated with another Tibetan concept of uh, tulku, which is a um, what we would consider like a reincarnation of like the Dalai Lama. So these enlightened beings that decide to come back to earth to teach others that's kind of been conflated with the idea of the of the tulpa because of theosophy and the people involved in theosophy and for whatever reason they've conflated these two terms it's happened that way so i think there is i don't know maybe i'm like trying to stand with one foot in one school and one foot in the other school or or, or not the school but a way of thinking at least uh 
that I think it it does add to the value of knowing historical sources and where things come from, what they mean, how they've changed over our idea of time. And, you know, of course, history is all about linear time. So, you know, I think for somebody like me who coming into contact with an idea such as hyperstition that Robert talks about, uh, for me, that was an enormous challenge because I do have to try to stand in one, you know, in one area and in another area to like play devil's advocate in a way, but I can see the value in both ways of looking at it. So uh, I would hope that that more people could start to think in in that plural way of looking at it, that you can see it in a historical way and you can see it in this in this way, this traditional way of doing it, and there's value in that, but you can also see it in this other way of looking at it that 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 allows for different interpretations that you don't have to be stuck to the historical fact of something or the empirical fact of something because there is something deeper or something larger taking place and happening within this phenomena and i don't know maybe i'm not doing it justice uh, robert but that's kind of how i've understood how you've been trying to explain hyperstition to me. I agree. Like there's one way of doing things. There's another way of doing things. I think you can do both of those things at the same time while also doing neither of them, which is this, my kind of paradoxical approach to research. Yeah. Uh, But what's to lose from allowing people to do creative work research? I don't think it, there's a problem with it, but I, that's just my opinion. And that's, that. that's fair. But if we're going to perpetuate the humanities as something relevant, because it used to be very relevant. Um, it's still relevant in some contexts, but for various socioeconomic reasons, it's becoming less important. Uh, some people would just do away with it and have STEM uh, and yeah. maybe social science. Uh, so what's to lose from letting us uh, try new things? Like, it's not an experiment unless you can potentially fail. But what's the point of doing anything if you might, if you know you're going to succeed? Excellent uh, take a point. risk, I don't know. Well, I think to play devil's advocate, we could make it even worse and aid the destruction of the humanities by... You know what I'm getting at? This isn't my position, but I think this is something that a lot of scholars would say to us right now is this is the last thing that we need to prove that we are, as a humanities, are still important because this stuff is so fringe and marginal that it would only help to dismantle the humanities as something that's worth continuing. So there's that. So it would discredit as, as a form of dis- discrediting the humanities, you mean? Yeah, because the, the, in the humanities, there is this space for creative research, but in wider society, there isn't really a space for academia to be creative. Then oh, you go to the arts. Yeah. So it's like there, be, beyond the walls of the university, there is an even bigger problem of situating like what does the academy still mean like what is it supposed to do and I I think a lot of people still think well it's supposed to answer it's supposed to give us answers to questions and so it's that wider role that that you that we also need to stay aware of because in this area there are no easy answers it's kind of not the point to go into these topics to find answers it's to explore the ambiguous and to let the ambiguous be ambiguous. So it feels like it calls for an entirely new way of interpreting what it means to be an intellectual. So just throwing that out there, I mean, it's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a problem, but it's an exciting problem. I, I just hope that 
it's also exciting for others and not just for, for us. Because, yeah, I wonder sometimes, like, when does a scholar become part of, of, this, of this phenomenon? Like, when do we bridge that gap and become part of, say, the occult community discussing Hellier? Like, where is that boundary? And do we need to care about that boundary? Maybe we don't. But yeah, it's it it's becoming more blurry, and I find that exciting. But likewise, yeah, I don't know. It feels dangerous, which is part of the <laughs> which is part of the fun. That makes it. Fun. But I kind of sympathize with with older generation mm-hmm. scholars, and and I mean, not to say that all young scholars would be open to to doing the right. kind of creative research we're talking about. Mm-hmm. I do kind of sympathize with their fear that this is kind of going against the core mission of what we're supposed to do as scholars, Mm -hmm. which is kind of the point, right? Because we're limiting ourselves so much. And this is something that, that has been bugging me so much about Western esotericism as a field. I mean, we're literally rescuing the history of Western culture from being a story about the dark middle ages to this glorious triumph of science and rationalism. Like we're literally fighting that idea. We're saying that Western culture has so much more and it, and it has place for all of these subjects, but at the same time, we're still an intellectual discipline, which is not supposed to give credit to these same ideas and currents that we're actually uncovering, but then we woke them up anyway. So it's it's a strange game to play as a scholar Western esotericism. You're inviting all of this stuff in, but then it's not supposed to change anything. But it can't not change everything. So it's just yeah. it feels like something akin to hellier. Like you're you've invited something into the academy that is just gonna start eating away at everything. But at the same time. Yeah, I don't know. Are you guys getting what, get what I I'm getting? getting what you're, I'm getting what you're saying. Tro- it's just, I don't... Trojan horse, maybe? Yeah, I don't have a um, a real uh, interesting answer or response to what you said. I'm just kind sure. of... Uh, I don't either. Just thinking about, about it has kind of left me quiet. Um, but there is a part of me that that does think that but the serious study of something I think has merit. And for someone who has spent, you know, years of their life studying something, learning all that they can about it, I think they have a more of a credibility than does some Joe off the street who claims to be an expert. I'm going to use a, a really cliche uh, example here but in the West Memphis 3 trial the so called so called occult expert that they had on there wasn't an academic it was some guy that just bought a, a so called diploma off of the internet or wherever he got it but didn't really have that serious study behind the this subject matter and he was supposed to be the expert on it and this we're talking about people's lives here no you know so while while i'm i'm open for you know for for people to you know to study this on a you know on their own terms and do this just as a hobby or whatever they're doing that's great but I think there comes a different level of of knowledge or at least a different level of maybe expertise when you've really devoted your your years of your life to studying something. And that has to mean something. And in my opinion, kind of what you brought up, uh, Thomas, about, you know, kind of an interaction with the people that are out there doing the field work that are, you know, investigating this stuff and, and experiencing it real time doing and they're totally emic i can offer something to that even if it is an etic perspective i can still offer something to that i think i agree 
Likewise. So who knows? Maybe maybe the Hellier team will hear this and they'll <laughs> they'll contact Oh yes, please. <laughs> they'll contact us and say, Hey, help us out here. What does this mean? I think that would be very, very helpful, very yeah. useful. Or honestly, like people doing paranormal research, um, a little bit more than as a hobby, I would love to consult, uh, help be involved. Like exactly. scientists can do things outside of research, like lab consultation for all sorts of people. There's no reason that scholars of occultism and various other things shouldn't be able to consult, uh, and lend insight. Yeah. Um, you know, send me an email. I'm, I'm in. I'm sure there would be other people who disagree and would have different opinions about it. But um, for me, I think it's uh, it's an interesting area to kind of explore and see how something like that could unfold. Well, I want to thank you both. You have um, put in a, a marathon discussion here about everything hellier and everything else <laughs> literally everything else so thank you so much for that and uh, who knows maybe this will turn into something that we come back and do again yeah thank you to both of you uh this was so much fun i, I, really I had a great time thank you yeah, same I hope you've enjoyed this roundtable discussion. We all had a really good time getting together to discuss all of this stuff, even though we didn't get to all of the topics we had on our list. My thanks again to Robert and Thomas. If there is anything in this episode that you, the listener, still have questions about, or perhaps you have new questions that have arisen out of all of this, please let me know, as Thomas and Robert are very happy to come back to answer listener questions. And please give me some feedback. Did you like this type of informal discussion? Would you like more of this type of content? I look forward to hearing your opinions. You can contact me on my various social media platforms, on my YouTube channel, or email me through the website. And as always, thanks for listening.